The following is a composite of some of my favorite videos I have created on the topic of the Eastern Left Hand Path. Hopefully also this will help show the similarities and the differences between the Eastern Path and the Western. I hope you enjoy it. When evaluating the esoteric or occult from a wide perspective, I can't help but be fascinated with the idea of the eternal natural law. I've made other videos on this topic, but I think it's good to go back and revisit this idea. Now, what is it? It's the theory that there was once a philosophy, similar to what Aldous Huxley called the perennial philosophy, that spanned the Eurasian continent from India to Ireland. It was spread roughly five to six thousand years ago by the shamans or the priestly caste of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, a warrior people that domesticated the horse and invented the chariot. Now, why do we think there was a common root? It's because of language, customs, and the very real similarity of the gods. But what is this root philosophy? Simply put, it's the idea that you and the divine are one, not separate. As I touched upon in my last video, Gods of Your Black Soul, Zoroaster, about 3,000 years ago, separated the shadow from the god, thus creating the good god, bad god, duality. This philosophy was later spread across the West by the Abrahamic faiths. And what effect did this have on the human psyche? It separated the individual from the divine spark by creating a fear of one's own shadow. Thus, one had to beg to be saved from who they really were. This is a great way to keep the masses subservient. Just convince them they were born corrupt and needed to be saved. And this idea all but destroyed the eternal natural law in the West. Ah, but on a side note, Lucifer stole the divine spark from Yahweh and offered it back to us, but few, sadly, have accepted his gift. Because of the destruction committed by the Abrahamic faiths, namely Christianity and Islam, here in the West, reconnecting with the eternal natural law is like trying to evaluate the custom of strangers across a vast chasm. Some have tried to reconnect. Most have failed. They failed because they relied upon a version of the eternal natural law filtered through the lies perpetrated by the Abrahamists. But in the East, the eternal natural law was never wiped out. The Islamists tried, but it survived. There, it is known as Sanatana Dharma, which basically translates to eternal natural law. It also has a more popular name. Thus, there in the east is a bridge across the chasm, that chasm of ignorance, a bridge called 
Sanatana Dharma. A friend recently asked a couple of very valid questions concerning whether the Eastern Left Hand Path could truly be called Left Hand Path as we perceive it here in the West. Before we get into the questions, I'll preface this by explaining that my interest in Eastern Left Hand Path philosophy actually stems from my longtime obsession with Druidism. Not the modern bullshit hippie Druidism, but Druidism from history. Turns out there are numerous similarities between the Hindu Brahmins of India and the Druids of Western Europe. The theory goes that there was an ancient philosophy, sometimes referred to as the eternal natural law, that spread across the Eurasian landmass by the Proto Indo Europeans some 6,000 years ago. And remnants of this philosophy can still be found in not only India, but in modern esoteric practices here in the West. Now, his first question, and I'm paraphrasing, is, how is it that practitioners of Eastern philosophy could truly be left-hand path if the end result of becoming as Shiva is, is a oneness with Brahman? Shiva being one of the Trimurti, the three symbolic faces of Brahman. That's a good question. Now, to begin with, you're not going to, you're not going to be doing the right-hand path thing and snuggle up in Brahman's lap, because Brahman has no lap to snuggle in. Brahman's not like any understanding we have of God or gods here in the West, even though some have tried to equate Brahman to Yahweh. The reason for this, I guess, is to make Brahman more palatable for Western tastes. The major difference between Brahman and the gods we're familiar with is Brahman is non-personal and is not considered a god or goddess. It has no sex to be worshipped. It is instead a concept for understanding the nature of reality. The closest thing we have to Brahman in the West would be the idea of the all in Hermeticism. Now, since my personal psyche is the only thing I can be 100% sure of, I perceive the left-hand path from a Jungian psychological perspective. Because of this, I see Brahman as consciousness, conscious reality, the most fundamental aspect of existence. The second question, and this one really made me think, is if the Agori, for instance, are purely heterodoxical, then they must recognize or acknowledge the Orthodox, thus not being free from the Orthodox, and if so, then how can they truly be called left-hand path? And again, I, I'm paraphrasing. I, I think I get this question. It's uh, kind of like those reverse Christians we have here in the West, you know, the kinds of Satanists that are simply reacting against Christianity and their Christian upbringing. Now, my response to this question would be the state of Shiva himself and what he represents. Shiva is the god of Atman, the divine spark in you that spark that is not unlike the black flame. He is the left face of the divine, the God who lives amongst the funeral pyres with ghosts, devils, and demons. He is the destroyer, the destroyer of that which keeps you from becoming the higher self. In my view, perceiving Shiva from a right-hand path perspective is the anomaly even though the vast majority of Shavas do so. And why do they? Because it's easier to go down the right-hand path than the left. It's not unlike what's going on here in the West with a certain well-known temple dedicated to Satan. Why is this satanic organization so popular? It's because it's right-hand path, the easy path, when Satanism should be, in its pure form, left. 
I hope these brief answers have helped out not only my friend, but others to understand my perspective on the Eastern left-hand path philosophy. Comparative mythology is a major aspect of this channel. Finding those connections between the different cultural interpretations of the gods and monsters, angels and demons, I think is, is vitally important to try to obtain some sort of truth, if you will, to try to find what's really going on, not what we want to be true, but what is possibly the truth, if that makes any sense. Uh, and even if we don't find that, that deep down innate truth, it's the journey, it's the, it's the search that stimulates me. Well, recently, an individual had written in one of my videos that, that Satan and Shiva are not the same thing. And my response to that person was, yes, you're right, they're not the same. And also this individual wrote that Satan is the adversary to the Abrahamic God, Yahweh, let's call him Yahweh, where Shiva is not the adversary to Brahma, the creator. And that's very much true. Now, this got me to think, okay, what, why is it do we here in the West utilize Satan as the preeminent entity, if you will, on the left-hand path. And in the East, it tends to be Shiva. I find it fascinating from a cultural perspective that we here need to utilize the adversary while they in the East don't. And the reason for this is Christianity is the is at the foundation of Western civilization. A culture's framework is built upon what they believe on a spiritual level. And as they say, Western civilization was, was, its foundations are based on two different cities, Athens in the sense of democracy, and Jerusalem with the Judeo-Christian traditions. And at a deeper spiritual level, deeper than the political, much deeper than the political, is the spiritual. So Christianity is ingrained. It's, it's codes and ethics. It, it's, it's, it is the foundation of Western civilization. Now, I know a lot of people don't like hearing that, but it is a fact. Now, for us, here in the West to be, let's say, heterodox or antinomian or however you want to phrase it. To take that first step on the path, I think it is important to, to take that step with Satan. Especially if you were raised religious. You have to let that go. You have to let the dualistic thinking 
that's so ingrained here in the West. The good, the bad. You know, the good God, the bad God. The Uhuru Mazda, the Araman. The, 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 the Jesus Satan. You have to let that dualistic thinking go. That's why Satan is so important here in the West. Where in the East, their overall perception of the gods, the gods are all aspects of the single God, or, or more than a God. Consciousness itself, Brahman. Brahman is consciousness, it is reality. And everything, all the gods, are simple reflections of this greater God. They don't have to divorce themselves from their supreme being. Brahman is a concept, it's not so much a being. They don't want to divorce themselves from that concept. They want a shortcut to divinity, see? And in a sense, we're doing that also here in the West, but utilizing different means, of course. They, they dare to venture out onto the edge, and in some case, go over it as a shortcut to the divine, the divine aspect of the self, finding the God in them and elevating that God in them. So, getting back to the initial point, yes, this person is correct. Satan and Shiva are not the same thing. The only similarities they really have is through Shiva stems from a horn god called Pashupati, okay? Now, Pashupati, in a sense, became Shiva. What happened here in the West is Satan, which was a faceless being in the Bible, had no physical qualities, took on the face or the persona, the mask, that is, of the horn god of Western European paganism. That could be Pan, Cronanos, Faunus, so on and so forth. So both have a horn god connection. On a social networking site, I came across a conversation about the nature of consciousness. And what was asked was the most simple of questions. What is it? What is consciousness? The answer is also simple. No one knows. There is no true science of consciousness. Well, you might ask, what about psychology? That's, that's the study of the mind. Now, the phenomenon that is consciousness can be broken down into three sub-questions, if you will, depending on what aspect of consciousness you want to focus on, namely content, dimension, or structure. But there's no true science because consciousness is subjective, and science is all about measuring the objective, which helps to reinforce the materialist argument. And what's fascinating is that consciousness seems to have an effect upon the structure of reality. This occurs on a quantum level because the wave function of entangled particles collapses when a measurement is observed. Put it simply, the basic building blocks of reality are in one form, then seem to be altered by the mind of the observer. Matter is altered by consciousness. Now, do I 
personally believe this to be so, I, I don't know. I've, I've read arguments from both sides. Some see it as a great mystery, while many quantum physicists think that they have it figured out, that it isn't all that mysterious. Who knows? Science doesn't have all the answers and never will. Objective reality is just too vast, and for every question that's answered, multiple new questions arise. Don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking science. It's necessary, and its contributions are overwhelming. For instance, if it wasn't for science, I wouldn't be speaking into a microphone right now, but instead shouting from a hilltop. Now, my big question when it comes to consciousness is this. Is there a greater consciousness or a master consciousness, one light, if you will, with many different reflections, such as the light of a full moon reflecting off an ocean, lake, pond, puddle, drop of water? In Hinduism, this is Brahman. Brahman is the never-changing concept of consciousness, the highest universal principle, the absolute reality. Dualistic teachings believe that Brahman is distinct from the individual soul or Atman, whereas non-dualistic schools such as the Tantric left-hand path teach that Brahman and Atman are one and the same, contained within one another. Now, some may think, isn't that the right-hand path? Because the individual is united with the Supreme, the, the God. Understand that on the right-hand path, one is on the road toward a connection with the higher but that higher will always be greater than you and just out of reach. That way they can keep you in the fold. While the left-hand path is the road to truth, the truth being that the potential of you becoming your own God is already there. You just need to break the shackles that the status quo and your ego mind have placed upon you. Brahman, as the greater consciousness, is the impersonal eternal principle and first cause of the universe, or consciousness bringing about reality. As I've already stated, some believe that consciousness has an effect upon the quantum wave function. So, in a sense, Shiva, as an aspect of Brahman, brings about reality. For Shiva is consciousness that is aware of itself. When I personally meditate and do tantric breathing exercises, I dwell upon consciousness being aware of itself. I'm conscious of my consciousness. Like a mantra, I let this go over and over in my mind. Now, Shiva is one of the three faces of Brahman, the left face. Brahma and Vishnu being the other two, is the aspect of Brahman one on the left-hand path must be connected to. He is the darkness, and darkness is much greater than light because you'll go blind staring at the sun. And as the dark aspect of consciousness, Shiva is divided into a male and female pair, Shiva and Shakti and through vibrations caused by the, this supreme essence of consciousness, Shakti is activated. In this case, consciousness not only altered reality, but brought it into being. Think about it. This is analogous to the Big Bang. Shiva consciousness is the first cause of the universe. He does the observing and Shakti is one with the reaction. Question, why do you have Shiva and other Hindu gods in your practice? 
why not? Have you ever looked into Eastern left hand path traditions? It's fascinating. I've always been a very curious bastard with a restless mind. I search for information and inspiration from as many different sources as I can. But not everyone's like that. Maybe, maybe you're the type that's adopted an established method that speaks to you, that you fit nicely into. And you feel no need to go, to go beyond the boundaries of it. If that works for you, good. Me, on the other hand, I haven't found that one method. Instead, I have an eclectic array of influences, which has contributed to a philosophical mosaic, if you will. And the left-hand path, from the Hindu perspective, is a major part of that greater whole. But, you may ask, why? Why go to the East, to a culture you have no direct connection to? First off, the soul goes where it goes, and below the ego level, there are no borders, no boundaries. There are no cultures, no races. The soul has no race. All is fluid, and where the current takes you, you go. And from a more pragmatic perspective, I go to Hinduism, and not all Hinduism is left-hand path, of course, because of its antiquity. Because if you're seeking truth, you have to go to the source. It's like this. Imagine you're doing research on World War II. And instead of just going to books or to someone who studied it from an academic perspective, you can speak to a veteran of that war and get a first-hand account. That's what Hinduism is. It's a first-hand account account of what has been referred to as the eternal natural law, that ancient proto-Indo-European spiritual philosophy, a tradition that was nearly wiped out by the Abrahamic faiths, a tradition that's at the foundation of what's called heathenism, paganism, witchcraft, and the occult, that most clandestine of sacred knowledge knowledge that had to go into hiding, into the shadows, not to be completely destroyed. Now, is Hinduism pure, as in it's never been tainted or, or altered? No, of course not. As it's moved throughout Asia over the millennia, it's absorbed into its makeup many different influences from many different cultures. But it's the closest you're going to get to the source, that core philosophy, that pure gem because its foundation has stayed intact since those proto-Indo-European warriors first swept across the Eurasian landmass. While here in the West, we've had to rely on scant evidence to piece together to, to find some truth. It's like a paleontologist who finds a couple of bones and then attempts to reconstruct that dinosaur, while the Hindus have just about all the bones. That's the reason why I add left-hand path Hinduism into my practice, a practice called sinisterism. Now, when I came up with that term, I wasn't trying to codify a new religion, nor am I trying to demean those who practice established Western left-hand path traditions, not at all. Like I've stated many times, I respect anyone, anyone who dares to publicly announce that they are a practitioner of the dark arts, a philosophy highly vilified by the status quo. Sinisterism is simply a term for those who don't fit within a specific paradigm but instead take from many different belief systems. It's about taking from different practices to create that method that works for you. That's Sinisterism. Carl Jung, the uh, pioneering psychologist, had stated that he thought it was a bad idea that Westerners get into, let's say, uh, Eastern metaphysical or philosophical thought uh, or traditions. 
he thought they would have a very difficult time understanding him because the Eastern traditions are very, how should I say, their interpretation of the spiritual is very poetic, very metaphoric or metaphorical. It's, uh, it's it, basically what they're trying to, what they attempt to do is use words to explain that which cannot be explained with words, if that makes any sense, to convey meaning through metaphor. Hope that made some sense. Anyway, now, <clears throat> recently I'd done an interview where, in the interview, it was basically about the sect and so on, in the interview I had stated that I thought Shiva was the highest or the most appropriate personification of the left hand path and that may have surprised some people due to some messages I received most would think Satan of course and I've had few ask me well Shiva that means you're a Hindu like, of course not you know gods are open to be interpreted by anyone. You don't have to be of any specific denomination or, or follow any traditional or religion or whatever to find some connection with these, with these metaphors, these metaphorical deities. Now, why is it that I think Shiva is the best personification of the left-hand path. Now, to begin with, not everyone that just say prays to or uh, finds meaning in the symbol that is Shiva uh, is necessarily left-hand path. Some are right-hand path. Many are right-hand path. Now, in Hinduism, in the Vedic traditions, you have two major denominations, if you will, those that follow Vishnu and his many incarnations, and one of them being Krishna, and those who follow Shiva. Now there's others too, other denominations, but let's say these are the two, let's say, most popular. Now picture, if you will, a a great circle, all right, and that great circle represents what's called Brahman. Now, Brahman is the great collective consciousness. He is well, not necessarily he. It is. It is God, but not not God in the Western tradition. Not that not that trickster God Yahweh that we find, in, you know, amongst the Abrahamic believers. No. That's not what I'm talking about. It's God more, it's more of the, this God that is consciousness. That is this great cosmic consciousness, if you will. Now, in this circle, you have the three major gods in the Hindu tradition. Uh, you have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Now, Brahma is the creator. Brahma created it all. And because of the fact he created it, he's kind of, he's, he's pretty much ignored. I mean, he just did the creation and he took off. And there's very few temples dedicated to Brahma. Uh, Vishnu, he is the preserver, the sustainer. He keeps things going. And Shiva, Shiva is the, the destroyer. Now, also within the circle, now picture something called Atman. Atman is your own personal consciousness. It is your psyche, your soul. Now, Hindu gods in the Vedic tradition, I mean, there, there is a god for everything. Everything from monkeys to emotions, you name it, it is personified. It has a face. 
uh, an example here in our tradition. Let's say uh, we say Mother Earth. We give the Earth uh, personification when we use that term. But they do that with everything. That's why they have a million gods. Now, the god that that okay Atman, the god that that gives Atman its face. The god of, of the personal consciousness, if you will, is Shiva. So picture the circle, all right? You have Shiva, and let's say Atman is a, is a dot in the middle of the circle. Shiva is connected to that dot, okay? He is the god, he's the personification of you. There is a tradition <clears throat> amongst Shaivists. They chant Shivo Ram, Shivo Ram. And what that means is I am Shiva. Now, if you're sitting in a Christian denomination, you know, a Christian church, and you get up and say, I'm Jesus, you're gonna get hauled away. See. But in the in the Shaivistic tradition, you can say that. You can say, I am Shiva. Now, Vishnu. On the other hand, now he's not connecting to Atman. He's connecting to Brahman, the greater consciousness. See, so what do we have here? Okay, we have Vishnu connecting to a greater consciousness, hence right-hand path. We have Shiva connecting to Atman. You, your, your your personal psyche hence left hand path personifying and deifying you self deification may seem a bit confusing may uh, some people this may turn off some people some traditional satanic types but just remember all gods all gods are metaphorical They are all aspects of us and the world around us. They are symbols with faces. In my humble opinion, no image better represents the left-hand path than the personification of the dark absolute called the goddess Kali. For like the left-hand path, she does not easily fit into the typical narrative of good versus evil, but in fact transcends both. In mythology, Kali is the consort of Lord Shiva, born from the brow of the goddess Durga. During battle, Durga became so enraged that her anger burst from her forehead in the form of Kali. Once born, the black goddess went wild, drunk on the blood of her victims. To stop her, Lord Shiva threw himself under her feet. Shocked at this sight, Kali stuck out her tongue in astonishment and put an end to her homicidal rage. As Kali danced upon Shiva, it evolved into a sexual act. She straddled him, she being on top, taking control, for if Shiva had not given in, Kali would have destroyed the world. Kali is the ferocious form of the mother goddess represented with perhaps the most intense features of all the gods. She has four arms with a scimitar in one hand and the head of a demon in another, while her other two hands bless her followers. She has two decaying heads for earrings, a string of skulls, her necklace, and a girdle made of human arms. Kali's form is ripe with symbolism. 
Her long, wild, black hair represents nature's freedom from civilization. Her wide eyes alert, ablaze with the fury of two molten pits are an expression of her violent intensity. Under the third eye of Kali are the signs of the sun and moon, which represent the driving forces of nature. The black complexion of Kali represents the darkness from which everything was born, for she is the substance of reality, the blackness out of which the stars shine. Her nudity portrays the primal aspects of nature. She is often depicted as such, for she has no permanent qualities. She will continue to exist even when the universe does not. It is therefore believed that the concepts of black and white, good and bad, do not apply to her. She is the pure, unmanifested energy, the Adi Shakti. One does not worship Kali in the traditional sense, but instead enacts with her divinity from a subjective perspective. But with her, as with all left-hand path deities, we risk madness. And in this madness, Kali both creates and destroys, intoxicated with the paradox that death feeds on life, and life feeds on death. On the left-hand path, it is necessary to enter the spontaneous chaos that is our true nature by breaking taboos. And as the great emancipator, Kali is there shattering the chains of slave morality, thus allowing one to break those taboos. In the end, it is Kali's combination of sex, death, beauty, horror, and liberation that epitomizes the meaning and essence of the left hand path. That quote was a description by the French artist Henri Masson of his drawing for ASFL, a journal and secret society founded by the writer Georges Bataille. What we know of ASFL, the organization, is a bit sketchy due to its members' strict vow of silence as to its inner workings. What we do know, though, is that they perform dark rites and had a preoccupation with Nietzsche and sacrifice. And Asafel was Dionysian in philosophy, as in the essence of the Greek god Dionysus being its archetypal foundation. Check out my video on Asafel for more details. I'll leave a link down below. Dionysus is the god of divine madness, that inability to to discern the boundaries between appearance and reality. And Dionysianism, as popularized by Nietzsche, blurs the lines between self and nature, a philosophy in which the state of the world is one of chaos. For, he believed, humanity was alone facing the whims of fate and the forces of nature. This point is very important. It's something most people refuse to face, taking refuge in faith and an afterlife, thus dying before really getting a chance to truly live. All forms of enthusiasm and ecstasy, along with drunkenness and madness, can be called Dionysian. Ancient Greece was not only the cradle of Western civilization, but was also the birthplace of rationalism and empiricism. Because of this, the Greeks lost touch with their lower instincts, hence uh, an inversion of the orthodox practice of the status quo was needed to bring about balance in the psyche of the citizenry. 
Thus came forth the Dionysian mysteries. Drumming, dancing, the consumption of alcohol and hallucinogenics lowered inhibitions, thus liberating the individual and returning them to a more primordial state. Transgressive sexual acts replete with pain and blood were common along with the torture of animals that were then torn to pieces and eaten raw. And it is believed that this act of ritualistic dismemberment was sometimes performed on human beings. But if you think Dionysian madness has gone the way of the chariot and toga, think again. For music, especially heavy music, is very Dionysian because it bypasses the rational mind, instead going directly to the instinctive chaotic emotions. It speaks to the body and the carnal, the body, not the head, hence headless, asaphel. The word asaphel comes from the Greek meaning headless, as in without a leader or without God. But it can also pertain to the dismissal of the Apollonian or the rational. Now, within Hinduism, the equivalent to Dionysianism would be the Vamakara. The term Vamakara is, is tantric in origin, literally meaning left-hand path. This is a heterodox tradition in which there is no distinction between pure and impure. Everything is sacred. Vamakara entails ritual practices replete with taboo breaking that conflicts with orthodox Hinduism, such as performing ritualistic sex, eating meat, drinking alcohol, and getting fucked up. It's a process in which consciousness moves toward integration with the natural world. And a popular goddess amongst tantrics is Chinamazda. The word Chinamazda is comprised of two words, Chinna meaning severed and Masta meaning the head. She is a goddess depicted holding her decapitation in her left hand and a scimitar in her right. She is naked but for a snake, a few ornaments and a garland of skulls. Three spurts of blood spray out of Chinamasa's neck and are consumed by her head and two attendants. This is while she stands upon the Hindu god of sex and his wife as they copulate. There are multiple tales as to the origins of Chinamasta, but the most popular begins with the goddess Harvey and her two attendants bathe. While standing in a river, feeling the flow of the rushing water over the naked body, Harvey becomes sexually aroused. At the same time, both of her attendants complain to her about being hungry and beg her for nourishment. As a mother goddess, she cannot refuse their request, thus she decapitates herself with a scimitar, placing her head in the palm of her left hand. Three streams of blood spring out of her neck, entering her mouth and those of her attendants. After they are satiated, she places her head back on her body and returns home. Now, what the fuck is this, you might ask? Does it mean? Much of Tantra is represented by sex and blood, thus you'll find some practitioners using the worship of Chinamazda and black magical rites. But some say this story is a symbolic representation of Kundalini awakening. Kundalini, if you don't know, refers to the primordial energy contained at the base of the spine that is often depicted as a snake. And here we have a comparative mythological connection to Lilith, but that's a different video.
Once awakened, this serpentine energy travels up the chakras of the body into the crown chakra where higher consciousness is triggered. But honestly, myself, I think it's the opposite. Instead of rising to a higher state, the tale of Chinamazda is an allegorical rendering of a lowering, thus dwelling within the primordial base. Now, her standing upon the god of sex as he fucks his wife symbolizes controlling the sexual urge, but it does not repudiate it. It does not represent the Abrahamic notion of sex bad. On the contrary, her beautiful naked body abandons that notion. In the Vamakara, sex is good and could lead one to enlightenment. Chinamasa is a fantastic representation of the left-hand path, for like Asafel, she symbolizes one escaping their thoughts, logic, and reason while her head being held in her left hand represents the leftward perspective over the intellect, thus emphasizing the needs of the body, the carnal, as a quicker, more straightforward path to sinister illumination.